I wish to make a very short plea to the politicians who have contested the last election to realize that which party wins the election is not half as important as which country emerges from it. I think there are few people in Guyana who today believes that we are properly governed. And to some extent, they all seem to feel that the Constitution is at fault. Where we stand today after the last elections doesn't offer much of a hope for constitutional change as we stand now. Two-thirds majority in Parliament, hard to get. I have spent much of the last three years writing about the need for constitutional reform to remove ourselves uh, from the barnacle of dominance in our political system. We've had nearly three decades of PNC's dominance, and we had 23 years of PPP's dominance. And that has taken us absolutely nowhere. The preamble to our constitution, to the need for guidance to always change the constitution as they go along, it speaks to it. There is a curious thing about Guyana. We tend to blame people rather than institutions. Let me begin with something that I think we all agree with. And that's where Dr. Jeffrey started. And that is that the concept of a constitution that is good for all time, for all circumstances, and that is perfect, is not a concept worth pursuing. As citizens of Guyana, we adopt these fundamental laws and make provision for their amendment to reflect changes in our society. That's what the penultimate paragraph of the Constitution said. The existing Constitution in Article 1, 19a, makes it clear, and I use the word clear not because I'm a lawyer, but because of my understanding of English language. It says, the National Assembly shall establish a parliamentary standing committee for constitutional reform for the purpose of continually reviewing the effectiveness of the working of the Constitution and making periodic reports thereon to the Assembly with proposals for reform as necessary. In 1966, we became independent. But we continue to subscribe to a degree of stupidness that we didn't recognize. Not Burnham, not Jagan, none of the rest. Not Sam Hines understood what I'm about to tell you. It is the difference between a problem and a paradox. You see, a paradox is something that you can't solve. Anytime you say something is a problem, your brain is set in such a way. And if you don't believe me, you could always go and read David Bohm's book called On Dialogue, in which he makes the point that sometimes, Without our noticing it, we accept absurd problems with false or self-contradictory presuppositions. The net result is that if you mix up a problem with a paradox, you can be sure that you're going to find that you can't solve it. And now, when you came in, some of you got a piece of paper that says on one side, the statement on the other side of this paper is false. And when you turn it over, it says the statement on the other side of this paper is true. Now, that 
is an example of a paradox. No amount of dialogue and dis di agreement and thing will get you out of that. But I can the racial or ethnic groupings that we have officially blessed from time immemorial and that were handed to us by the people who were our colonizers is a paradox. What in fact is happening it is one of those cases where we accept absurd problems with false or self-contradictory presuppositions. And here we run around saying that in this country called Guyana, we have to recognize that some of us are X and some of us are Y. And in the dichotomy of those who are not X are primarily Y, and those who are not Y are primarily X, we must have national unity. We have defined ourselves into the problems of a paradox. But as I told you, according to Bohm in Dialogue, there are no solutions to paradoxes. No. What? But I believe, and if I were to disagree with Haslin, that the problem is the two large ethnic blocks. Not how they see themselves, but how they are seen by each other. And some time ago, if you will permit me to quote myself, but it's written in a way that I, can't, that I can't repeat it. The existence of two large ethnic blocks which harbor historic suspicions and resentments about each other and which seek security in organizational form through political parties is the sole singular and fundamental issue that has been at the core of all Guyana's civil and political turmoil and instability since 19. So it's not only the existence of the two blocks, it's how they organize themselves politically. That's the second aspect of the problem. And the existence of these two blocks and the way they're politically organized has created a political culture in Guyana, a certain type of negative political culture. And if you examine it, it's one political culture, not two. The two parties don't have a separate culture. Each has the same culture. They straddle. They both straddle the same culture. And I would like to see the back of that culture broken by the current government by it undertaking constitutional reform. We have developing now a situation where neither of the major political parties will get over 50% by themselves. A constitution cannot be fixed for time immemorial, and no constitution can, can accommodate or can be un unchangeable. But we did not complete the job in 2000. And we did not complete the job because the parties could not agree. And the completion of the job involves the establishment of a political system in Guyana that takes account of the nature of our political organization, that is, the support of our two large political parties by the two large ethnic groups. A system which accommodates that and allows a government to be established which obtains the support of the vast majority of the people. In other words, a government that is considered, or a government which is accepted after being elected by 51, 52, or whatever percent, or a president, that's accepted, not supported, but accepted 
as the legitimate representative of our country. That is what we want. And that does not happen today, and it's a big problem. Thank you very much.